Sin cookies are a particularly, I think, clever way of being able to defend against uh, sin slot attacks. So, so if you recall, uh, the issue with the TCP three-way handshake is that when you have a client, let's see, you've got a client here, uh, and the client sends a sin message uh, to a server. Okay, the server has to actually allocate some space. It's going to actually have a, a table uh, that it has, and it's going to have to allocate some space on that table for information about this particular request. And so there's going to be a, a table with, with information about this particular transaction. And the idea is the server is going to then send back a, a SYN ACK. And then finally, the server has to wait back for an ACK packet. And that's how the, the typical handshake occurs. Now, in between the SYN ACK and the, and the ACK, the server's got the space allocated. And so the connection is what's called half open. And because the server has this half open connection, it's, it's basically maintaining this, this amount of space until the connection is effectively fully opened. And so if you have multiple clients, or maybe even the same client sending multiple SYN messages uh, to the server, then uh, the server is going to end up allocating all of its space for, uh, to maintain information about these SYN messages, and it won't be able to then uh, deal with uh, new messages that come in. So for example, if there's a new legitimate party uh, trying to connect to the server, it's going to send a SYN request. That SYN request will either get dropped or the server will crash or, or have some issues. Uh, because it'll have all these half-open connections that, that have space allocated to them. And, and of course, um, because it never receives an ACK back from the client, uh, that space is never going to become deallocated for enough, uh, for, for uh, really deallocated at all. And so it's not going to allow the server to kind of keep going on to what it needs to do. So now, uh, really to address this issue, and there's a pretty clever way to do it, what the server will effectively do is kind of avoid or as true actually allocating space. So, uh, and now let me actually first describe it conceptually, and then I'll talk about how you might actually implement it. So what it's going to do is imagine you've got this information. Let's say there's, there's a bunch of information here that's typically allocated as part of uh, a SYN request. And so this is, this is the information the server would allocate. And now what the server is going to do is take this information. It's going to basically cryptographically protect it. So, and then I'll talk about how that's done. So imagine it's now somehow protected this information cryptographically. And then it's going to send this information back with the SYN ACK. Okay. And then what it's going to do is it's going to require that when the client responds back with the ACK, the client has to respond back not only with the ACK, but it's got to include information or really the same information that was transmitted to it uh, by the server. Okay, and then the server can then take this information and kind of reconstruct what should go in the table. Okay, and, and the nice thing is that, uh, you know, it, from this perspective, it's, it's that the, the server is no longer actually maintaining state, it's actually kind of shifted that burden to the client and required the client to effectively allocate space for this, this piece of information that, that it's going to send back to the server. Okay. Now, this is how I would think of SYN cookies conceptually, but I think the real clever part of SYN cookies is not just uh, in the way that it was in this particular conceptual paradigm, but in how it was actually implemented in a way that would uh, be compatible with existing TCP implementations. And, and this particular idea is due to Dan Bernstein and Eric Schenk, uh, and they really kind of worked out um, how you could take a conceptual approach like this and make this work within the context of TCP. Okay, and the way they do this is they actually encode this information. They found a way to encode this information inside of what are called uh, TCP sequence numbers. And sequence numbers are included uh, as part of TCP packets. And in particular, uh, let me just write down sequence numbers. In particular, uh, TCP sequence numbers are sent part sent as, as back as part of the of the TCP uh, SYNAC packet. Okay, and, and they basically are sent back to the client. TCP sequence numbers are really what allow uh, for the reconstruction of the entire data stream, you help you kind of take all these pieces of the protocol and fit them back together. Okay. Now, the one nice thing with TCP is that it allows essentially uh, the standard kind of allows carte blanche, if you will, uh, in, in coming up with these sequence numbers. And, and so, for SYN cookies, the idea behind SYN cookies is to come up with a very special sequence or a special sequence number, rather. And it basically works as follows. So, there's kind of three elements to the SYN cookie. So, we have a timestamp, which is T. Okay, and you can think of this as a timestamp. And this is going to be not a regular timestamp, but it's going to be more of a, a coarse timestamp. And by that I mean that uh, 
it's uh, not going to be that fine. You'll be able to really, it'll be slowly incrementing. Uh, and in, in fact, one way you could do a timestamp like this is you could take the, uh, the actual time, uh, let's say in seconds, and you could shift it over by six bits, and that gives you essentially 64 second resolution. Uh, the other part of the sequence number in a sim cookie will be a value m, which is basically uh, called a maximum segment size, and I won't go into the full details of what that means, but because uh, uh, I think it's not necessary for understanding the scheme conceptually. Okay, and the final part of a sequence number s, and this is going to be, a, I'll, I'll actually allocate some more space to write s. s is basically going to be some type of cryptographic function. It's going to be, think of it as encryption with some key k uh, that only the server knows. So it's maybe I'll, I'll kind of mark it as a secret key and, and uh, uh, imagine I've, I've, uh, I'll put a little box around it so that you can understand it's, it's a secret key that only the server knows. And what, what, what you're going to actually be encrypting is some server-specific information. This is really the, the heart of some of the information that the server would normally have stored. And you're going to basically encrypt uh, the server's IP, the server IP, uh, server's port, so in other words, a port the server uses, the client IP, and the client port. Okay, and these pieces of information, they're, they're effectively encrypted. And what we really do for, for SIN cookies, we don't take these full values. We, we actually allocate, we take five bits from the timestamp. We take three bits from an encoding of the maximum segment size. And you take 24 bits from S. And you can think of this maybe as, as the least significant 24 bits of S. And together, you get a 32-bit the 24 plus 5 plus 3 is 32 bit. You get 32 bit sequence number. Okay, and we'll call that sequence number, that sequence number, we'll call it n. And now what the server is going to do is, as part of the SYNAC, it's going to send n in, in the SYNAC packet. So the SYNAC packet typically contains a sequence number, and the sequence number that the server will use is n. Okay, and then the client, um, typically when it receives a sequence number of any sort, has to respond back as part of the standard with the value n plus 1. Okay? Now what the server is going to do is it's going to take n plus 1. It's, it's going to get back n plus 1 from the client. It's going to construct n from that, which, which you can do by just subtracting 1. And then n in turn will be broken up into three components. It's going to basically, from n, it's going to say, well, this we know the first five bits represent this timestamp. The next three bits represent this maximum segment size encoding. And the final 24 bits represent this value s that I sent, which is kind of a cryptographic encryption or a cryptographic encoding, if you will, of, of a bunch of information like a server IP and server port, etc. Okay, now the first thing it'll do is it'll check is, is this timestamp a reasonable timestamp? You know, for example, is a timestamp within a, 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 the right time window? If it's, if it's completely off, then we already know that something went awry with this response that it could not have been legitimate. Uh, and if the timestamp checks out okay, let's say the timestamp is okay. It'll look at the uh, the value s that was sent, and it's going to say, well, is s a legitimate? Uh, could could s have been legitimately constructed? And it can determine this by basically taking s, and 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 recomputing what s should have been, because it knows from the packet it, it can recompute s on its own. It can say, well, what was the server IP server port, client IP client port? So it's going to recompute s on its own, and then it's going to say, well, is the s that I recomputed on my own is that match the s that the client sent me? Okay. Oh, and by the way, I should, I should clarify one thing, uh, which I think is useful, is that um, in addition to these values, the, the value of s also includes uh, an encryption, and in the encryption function has to also include the timestamp t, and so that kind of prevents um, prevents spoofing later on. So you, you can't take the same uh, the same value of s from one session and use it significantly later. You can only use it within the same window. But effectively, the, the nice thing is that s, because it's a function of t. Uh, this, the server can effectively recompute s and determine if if, uh, uh, if the s that it received from the client actually matches the s that um, uh, the, the s that it computed on its own. And if it does match, then we know that the, the essentially the sequence number is now valid. But the benefit of this whole approach is that uh, all this information that was previously allocated uh, no longer needs to be allocated because it can be recomputed directly from n. So the idea is that n now contains really the information that would normally have been in the state table. Uh, and, and you can reconstruct state table information from n, or in particular, you can do it from n plus 1 by subtracting 1, getting back n, breaking it apart 
into its constituent pieces and then figuring out what actually should have been encoded in the first place. Okay, and the nice thing with, with this particular approach with SIM cookies is that it is uh, TCP compatible. I think it's worth pointing out uh, because, again, you can imagine similar conceptual approaches, but sometimes uh, making this a conceptual approach work in practice, especially with an existing standard where people have already implemented it, uh, implemented the standard, is, is very challenging. And in the particular case of SIN cookies, you can implement this on a server. Even if the client does not have the SIN cookie implementation, if the client is any legitimate TCP client, if it has a legitimate implementation of the TCP protocol, without even knowing it, it will basically conform to being able to use SIN cookies without breaking. Okay, now there are some some drawbacks of SIN cookies, I think uh, one, of the, one of the main ones is that this maximum segment size, uh, it's, it's limited to just three bits and that only allows for eight possible segment sizes and that, that's a bit of an issue. And also, um, in order to really make this work properly, uh, you do have to reject certain TCP options, but I think that this is now getting into some of the details of the minutia, but I think for the most part, hopefully conceptually, this idea makes sense and, and hopefully conceptually you can see that it is quite powerful.